Chuck Hennessy. I'll start again for the recording. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zach Hennessy. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President of the Whole U NYC Network here at Public Health Solutions. We're grateful to have you all here with us today um, as we discuss uh, with you um, the role of healthcare providers in the social care network um, and how we can collectively work together uh, towards meeting the state's goals for Medicaid members. Um, we're really excited about the opportunity, um, opportunity that this waiver holds for Medicaid members, you know, the transformation um, and expansion of Medicaid benefits. Um, we're at a time and a place now to start considering um, health insurance, being able to pay for uh, rental assistance, for utilities, for uh, food, for incredible, um, incredible things needed that um, for Medicaid members in a way that's never been done before. Um, and so Go we, are, <clears throat> we are um, learning new things every day about the state's vision uh, and, and the policy. So we wanted to begin to share um, at a very basic level um, what we know and what we don't know yet. Um, but um, I encourage you all to uh, share today's presentation with any of your colleagues within your organization or um, in your network of healthcare uh, partners um, to be sure that um, as many people in who support members in Brooklyn, Queens, Once we get Manhattan, to um, have access to these resources. So with that, I will kick it over to uh, Natalie Tobier. She is our uh, Senior Director for Healthcare Community Partnerships Capacity Building. Um, so Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Yes, um, great to have you all here today. Um, I know many of you have been longtime participants in the Roadmap Advocacy Coalition led by Zach and Keisha. And some of you may have been at the CBO stakeholder meeting last week. Um, and we met, we have mentioned before that we're convening these smaller stakeholder groups to focus on the aspects of the SEN work that um, pertain to those groups. So this is the first of several healthcare provider stakeholder meetings that we intend to convene over the coming months. I don't know what she's saying. We should just saying that we have a You're muted, Natalie. Not intentionally. <laughs> I do not know where I where where I was muted. Um, I will back up. I will say that this is the first of several healthcare provider stakeholder meetings that we intend to convene over the coming months to share information with you, to gather your feedback, to hear about your questions and your concerns. Um, first, I want to take a minute to introduce myself and my team and to provide relevant background about our experience and our purpose. Um, so again, I'm Natalie Tobier, Senior Director, HCP Capacity Building. I've been with PHS for several decades, during which time I oversaw <clears throat> our sexual and reproductive health work, including some intersections with mental and behavioral health. And I currently oversee the team uh, within the SEN that will be delivering capacity building support to the SEN healthcare providers. And also we will be leading these team, these meetings as we move forward. And I will introduce key members of my team uh, a little bit in a little bit. So first, just some context about the work that we do. Um, as mentioned, our work historically centered on sexual and reproductive health, um, including operating our own clinical sites in Brooklyn. 
um, and also as in terms of serving as the federal family planning Title X grantee in New York City for many decades. Um, uh, through that, we administer funds in support of a network of family planning providers throughout New York City. Um, and additionally, we have operated um, a uh, SRH focused capacity building program for over a decade. <laughs> No, it's okay. I just have to which which it's very hard when people which follows a quality improvement learning collaborative model that brings together clinical sites with the common aim of improving the quality of care. Um, very often similar to the SCN screening, referral, and counseling services. Um, so our team designs QI tools and we provide QI coaching, training, and TA to participating sites as they work to implement new workflows and close gaps in care, thereby improving quality and accessibility of services. Um, over the years, we have refined our, um, our focus into different practice areas, and uh, but the common thread has always been supporting participant sites in adopting um, justice-informed patient-centered practices with an emphasis on health equity. And um, over the past few months, we've been pivoting to focus on the needs of the New York City healthcare practices that will be joining our SCN and integrating or continuing to carry out the health-related social needs screenings and navigation. So in short, our team is responsible for setting and achieving goals and designing solutions that advance health equity within healthcare systems through capacity building programs, projects rather. Um, our team applies best practices and innovative methods to the execution of scalable quality improvement projects which aim to improve health equity and access in New York City. And then our team, um, as very specific to the SCN will support the trustworthy integration of health related social needs screening and community resources into a broad range of healthcare settings. So um, I don't know if we're, I think we should go to the next slide where the agenda is. I forgot to mention, move the slide. So two more. Yeah, there we go. So today we will cover um, different pathways for healthcare providers to participate in the SCN. Um, and we will describe at a very high level the ways in which our team will interact with those providers who join the SCN. Um, in terms of questions, um, you know, I'm, I don't, I doubt that there's there's very many at this point. But what we will do is pause at the end of the subsequent section where we talk about joining the SCN to give you an opportunity to ask questions, and we'll do our best if we can to answer them. If not, we will certainly get back to you when, when we're able to in answer to those questions. So um, please feel free to put your questions into the chat as, as we go forward. So before um, I pass it over, I would like to take a moment in, to introduce uh, two of my colleagues who will be walking us through the agenda items today. They are Julia Keegan, who is the director of HCP Capacity Building for the SCN, and Leah Hargarden, who is the Quality Improvement and Evaluation Manager for the team. Um, I also wanna mention we have on the call with us today, Desiree Caro, who is our director um, on the Title X side and who also is lead on training initiatives and Diana Bermudez, who is the Senior Program Manager on our team who will be supporting our work on the SCN as well as on Title X. Um, so over to you, Julia. All right, great. Thank you, Natalie, for um, getting us started. Welcome again, everyone. My name is Julia Keegan. I use she, her pronouns. As Natalie said, I'm the Director of Healthcare Community Partnerships Capacity Building. Um, I recognize many names, which is very nice from the various projects and programs that our team has led, including our Title X work. Uh, so we're very glad to have you here. I'm very appreciative that you took this time on a Friday afternoon to join us for this first healthcare provider workgroup meeting. I'm not going to take too much time in this meeting to provide a detailed background on our social care network. Um, some of you may have attended our recent Roadmap Advocacy Coalition meetings. Our last one on August 15th has a lot of 
really great information about how PHS plans to lead our SCN. I recommend checking that out if you haven't seen it. It's on PHS's public YouTube channel. We can share that when we share out um, the materials from this meeting as well. There's lots of great detail um, that Zach and Keisha shared on that call about our SCN at large. But as Natalie said, today we're going to be really focused on um, you all as healthcare providers and what the opportunities are to partner with and interact with our social care network in New York City. Um, you can go on to the next slide, Desiree, please. Would you keep going? And one more. Great, thanks. Um, so there has been a lot of conversation in the recent Roadmap Advocacy Coalition meetings about the roles that community-based organizations will play in our SCN. So we're very excited to have this space that is dedicated to talking about the role that healthcare providers will have um, in our SCN and take a little more time to share more about the role that healthcare providers can play in the network. Um, so healthcare providers are critical members of our SCN, especially in terms of screening Medicaid members and providing an entry point to our social care network for folks who need access to community-based services. We've had quite a few questions about what differentiates a CBO from a healthcare provider within the SCN. So I want to um, start by level setting and providing some clarity there around what a healthcare provider is as it relates to our social care network. Um, and so based on New York State's guidance, we are defining a healthcare provider as an entity that provides healthcare and or behavioral health services to individuals, including Medicaid members. This includes a variety of provider types um, and different healthcare entities, hospitals, health systems, primary care practices, community-based clinics, federally qualified health centers, behavioral health providers, substance use treatment centers, health homes, patient-centered medical homes, IPAs, there are a lot of different providers um, that fit into the definition here. Um, and when we move forward in the future with um, solicitations for formally joining the network, there will be uh, far more detail there as well for you to reference. Um, in addition to being a healthcare provider, some of your organizations may meet the requirements for a community-based organization uh, partner of our social care network, and you may have already applied as a CBO through our initial CBO application process that took place um, last month. If that is the case, if that is your organization, I just want to flag that you don't need to join the network separately as a healthcare provider, nor complete the healthcare provider RFA or contracting process that I'll describe very briefly later on. Um, network partners need one contract with uh, PHS for their participation in the SCN, and that contract should encompass all of their planned services that they intend to deliver as a part of the network. So just um, for anybody who has gone through that CBO application process, you do not need to join in a separate way as a healthcare provider. Um, there will be you know, a variety of roles that healthcare providers play in the network as far as service delivery goes. Um, and given that you your organization meets the necessary requirements, and I'll go through that a bit later on, um, healthcare partners can and will do um, a variety of services through the social care network. So that includes ensuring that consent is obtained from Medicaid members in order to screen and refer them to services within the network, as well as to share their data with New York State and other partners who are a part of the SCN ecosystem. Um, consent will need to be collected from every client as a question zero of the screening process, and the language for that consent is currently in development by New York State. Um, I mentioned earlier that healthcare providers will play a really critical role in screening Medicaid members to assess for health-related social needs um, and ensure that they are being referred to providers for service delivery. Um, screenings that are conducted within the network must use the Accountable Health Communities or AHC screening tool. Um, it is a screening tool that is used all across the country, and the New York State approved version of this tool encompasses several different domains of health related social needs, uh, housing, utilities, food, transportation, education, employment and interpersonal violence. Um, healthcare providers can navigate Medicaid members to appropriate community based resources that meet the needs that are identified through screening. Um, some of your organizations may be service providers beyond healthcare and offer various food, uh, housing, or transportation related services. These are what we're calling in the SCN enhanced care services that will also be reimbursable through the social care network. 
Um, and some of you may have also applied to serve on our governance committee as a healthcare provider representative. Um, and last, I just want to mention that we also want to ensure that healthcare providers are serving an active role as participants in the network, and that'll include engaging in capacity building and collaborative learning with other healthcare providers within the network. And Leah is going to talk in more detail about that later on. So um, one does not need to provide all of the services that I've just described, but there are many opportunities for healthcare providers based on the services that you are offering um, to provide them through our social care network. Next slide, please. Um, so how a healthcare provider partners with our social care network will really depend on how they choose to integrate with the network from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, there is a graphic on the screen, uh, screen that you can follow as I talk through some of these briefly. Um, PHS, some of you may know and have worked with us um, in using a, the data and IT platform Unite Us, which will be our sole platform used for SCN services. Um, that includes screening, navigation, and those enhanced care services that I mentioned earlier. Um, healthcare partners that choose to onboard to and use the Unite Us platform as their sole technology solution for SCN services will be able to serve a similar role in our SCN to the CBOs, which is that they are able to join the network as a partner, provide screening, navigation, or even enhanced care services if your agencies deliver that, um, and to be reimbursed for those services. Um, healthcare providers also uniquely have the opportunity to alternatively use a data and IT pl platform that is interoperable with our network's data and IT platform. Um, this is the middle track here. I do want to be quite clear that it will be the responsibility of your organization to ensure that interoperability and the timeline for some of the statewide systems that need to be in place for that interoperability to happen is not entirely clear just yet. Um, and based on what we know from New York State, we do know that this interoperability route will allow healthcare providers to be paid for screening in year one. Um, it's possible that services beyond screening may be reimbursable by this interoperability pathway, but we don't anticipate that being an available option in the near term. Um, so if you are seeking or interested in reimbursement for navigation or enhanced care services, you must onboard and use Unite Us. Um, there are some healthcare providers I know that will not use Unite Us or will not establish interoperability with our systems. Um, and those healthcare providers will not be eligible for reimbursement for the services they provide for um, related to the SCN. We don't quite know yet what the process will look like for those healthcare providers to interact with the network, um, but we certainly are in the process of um, figuring that out and, and understanding how folks who don't fall into the first two buckets can still um, interact with our network and ensure that folks are gaining access to the services that they need through the SCN. Um, I recognize that um, many of you, if not all, are providing services that are um, Medicaid reimbursable. And for those of you who will join the network through a reimbursable pathway for one of those uh, first two pathways, I just want to make a quick note about New York State requirements regarding duplication of services and payment. Um, so SCN network partners or providers will only be reimbursed for SCN services if they have not been reimbursed from another source for those services. So a couple examples that we already have concretely um, is that health homes may only be reimbursed for screening and referral to or delivery of enhanced care services. It will exclude any services that already are within their existing paid scope of work. Um, similarly, FQHCs may be reimbursed for SCN services, but that is only if those services are not being reimbursed, like that particular service is not reimbursed by Medicaid fee-for-service, Medicaid managed care, um, or a third-party payer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we will be conducting a formal process to bring folks, uh, healthcare partners on as um, network partners in our social care network. We anticipate that down the line there will be um, a request for applications and a formal contracting process that will be necessary to uh, ensure that reimbursement is possible for folks who want to take one of those two routes um, for reimbursable social care network services. And we will share as much information about that as we can when we have it available. And we'll certainly be in communication in these work group meetings as well as um, via email. 
I would like to make one last note about sort of scaling up to our social care network services um, and note that there may be providers who would like to go live early as um, early members of our social care network. Um, we will be communicating more about what needs to happen to ensure that there is contract execution and that quality milestones are met for folks to um, provide services as part of our social care network. And so in reference to those quality milestones, there will be quality standards that are expected of network members um, in order to provide services. And I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Leah, who will talk us a through more of those quality standards and some of the um, opportunities and offerings and ways that our capacity building team will engage with you all to make that possible. So Leah, I will turn it. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm not turning it over to you yet. We are going to take questions for a little bit. So let me stop there um, and we will take some questions. So Leah, I will turn it over to you to facilitate some of the questions that we have. Um, if you put your questions in the chat, we will get to them. If you'd like to ask a question uh, verbally, you can raise your hand and we will certainly bring you off mute and do our best to answer questions that you have. Yeah, um, so the first question that I see that came in the chat um, is if the healthcare governance application is separate from the CBO governance one. Um, Julia, or the, I believe it's separate. Um, no, I understand no, that no, there was no, only no. one governance um, application that was. One, there was one. Zach, you're, you're breaking Sorry. up. Yeah. But but I'll I'll just maybe clarify that there was only one governance application that was released um several weeks back alongside the CBO network application. However, um as a part of kind of the, the the requirements for the governing body, it can include organizations above and beyond CBO, including healthcare, care management providers, government, and others. And so that application um, was comprehensive in that it, it allowed organizations that weren't CBOs to also um, submit an application to participate on the governing body. So we will not be releasing another um, governing body application. Great. Um, the next question I see um, is, it says there appears to be some confusion about the role of health home CMAs as healthcare providers versus CBOs, especially those that provide direct services, example, food and housing. Am I understanding correctly that they can enroll as both a healthcare and CBO provider with DHS? Keisha, mm -hmm. you want to take that one? There will be some limitations on health home uh, reimbursable services. We don't have all the details, but it appears that the navigation component uh, may be viewed as, in certain circumstances, as duplicative. So health homes should be able to be reimbursed for screening and should be able to be reimbursed for services, um, but not navigation in all cases. There is a second version of the operations manual, which we expect imminently from the state um, to resolve some questions about limitations on healthcare partners, including health homes and community health centers. Thank you for that. Can I just clarify one thing, the distinction between the health homes and the care management agencies? Um, and I think that's where that question was leading. The care management agencies having a range of services outside of health homes being one portion of their business um, and allowing them to also uh, contract around their uh, additional services that they provide that may be direct services um, for they that should, navigation. They and, should be able to, okay. and, and outside of the specific limitations on health home navigation if there there were other populations or they weren't doing that specific form of case management we think they should be eligible to do that as well great thank you and we're, we're working with doh around that updated language so appreciate any additional feedback you may have as on that as well thank you um, um the next question I see um, is can screening be completed over the phone? And if so, how, uh, how can consent be collected? 
screening can be conducted over the phone and any person-to-person uh, -person, uh, screening, whether that's over the phone or in person, can be reimbursed. Self-screening or uh, um, any other form of non- Back, you're human very encounter you're very breaking is out, not so it's reimbursable. Hard to hear, hard to hear your oh, answer. I get. I'll turn to Keisha for this. To, yeah, then to I think that. maybe I just the second part is um, any kind of member, patient, client self screen um, is non reimbursable. But screenings where there is a direct encounter, whether it's in person or via phone, um, would be reimbursable. But the question has to do with consent. How can consent be collected, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, for example, as so, an example, if you're on the phone with the client, but you're utilizing Unitas, there is an opportunity to capture that consent as a part of the screening process. And then that would be verbal consent, or do we have to send something to the client to sign? No, my understanding is the verbal consent that you've documented would be appropriate. Great. Um, All right, this is Chris Joseph. I also know that Unite Us has the option for pushing a link um, to collect consent via text. There's multiple ways, and it might behoove the group to see that demonstrated, but there is a way to collect consent verbally via text or in writing through the Unite Us platform. Thank you, Chris. Um, the next question um, I see is, uh, will healthcare partners receive any financial assistance from PHS to onboard Unite Us or is there a group discount? And I think there was a similar question around a cost of Unite Us. So healthcare partners, you know, our partners of our network, there'll be no cost to join um, Unite Us. If you onboard with us, we will be providing support to staff to onboard onto the platform, um, to train staff and ensure that everybody is up to speed and capable of using the platform. Um, yeah, Keisha, go ahead if you want to add anything. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm good. All right. Um, while we, while I have my mic off, Natasha, I see that you have a, a question that you'd like to ask verbally. Go ahead and unmute and do that. Hi, thank you. Um, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but um, do we need to have a health home program, or is the are we eligible if we have um, a variety of different case management programs, but no health home program? You do not need to be a health home. Great. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question, um, Kevin Howell here. So can you create a distinction between self because with the idea of a text, sending out a text and um, somebody filling out a form, would that be considered a self-screening? Um, so, yes, so it's not it's not reimbursable. OK. So anything that the consumer or does by themselves would be considered self-screening, whatever method of screening that is is provided uh, or the medium of screening. screening. Yeah, we, yes. I, I'm, I'm, opening you, the, I'm opening the manual to clarify that because there was some verbiage in the manual that said you can't screen via text. You can only send a link to, for example, our self-screen on the website to do it. So let me just kind of confirm the language as written in the manual, given that there was some language specifically to screening via text versus sending a link via text that would direct them to, for example, our screening tool on the website. Yeah, that's a, an important distinction. But then also I would say that the, if that is a, if that self-screening is a pathway to navigation, then you could be reimbursed for the navigation, yeah. even if the screening um, was not a screening, a, a billable screening encounter. 
but the, the, the screening was a self-screening, then the navigation could still. And Kevin, I found the language, it, it said screenings should not be conducted through text. However, they can be navigated to the online screening tool via text. So while that you can't, you know, submit, send something via text and request responses to that via text, but you, there Get will be a, an ability to link them out to, for mm -hmm. example, a screening tool on the web that they could yes. self me. No, definitely. Yeah, there'll be a link in the text and they'll click on that link and it'll take them to the website. Correct. And yeah, mm -hmm. got it. Qu one question regarding the health phone. Can, can we go back to the, we were reading the, the questions in the chat and then we'll go to people who raise their hand just to keep some consistency. So Leah, do you want to go back? Yeah, I think we can intermix questions, but I agree with the hand raising. It just makes it easier to see who might have a question. And um, so I'll There's ask one from the chat. I'll I'll ask one from the chat and then I'll move to um hand raising. Um uh okay, where are we? Um there's a question about how will you validate member eligibility for reimbursed um social care services. Sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, um, how do you validate member eligibility for oh. reimbursed social care services? Oh, there, there's, yeah, there's there's a very um, specific workflow that the state has outlined in the operations manual that those individuals that navigate um, on behalf of the network will execute. Um, there are, you know, a series of, of steps that take place um, after screening, where um, some of it will be, for example, if you utilize Unita, some of it will be configured in the Unitas platform through some electronic logic um, that would inform the navigator um, of that client patient member's eligibility for those enhanced care services to allow them to then navigate them to those SCN services. So, um, there will definitely be training on this workflow because for some of our navigators, including PHS navigators, it's a new process, but we anticipate that there will be some um, electronic configuration in the Unitas platform to support that process. Great. Um, we can go to um, a hand raise. I see Torian. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about, go back to Unitas. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, correct. Yeah, I want to go back to the, the points around Unitas. Uh, for healthcare partners who are looking at both of the social care technology platform, really interested to understand that. I didn't hear, I don't know if Keisha, you were speaking to this, uh, about uh, the capacity that's going to be provided for the partners, um, specifically around like the network access and also having the capability to integrate into our electronic health records. Is that something that uh, PHS will provide uh, resources for, or is, is that on the healthcare partners to do? It, it's it's the latter. Um, if you're utilizing Unitas, I think that that makes it it easier. Um, the state has been very clear in that capacity building funds um, will only be available to organizations participating in the network as CBOs, and so um, any kind of cost associated with um, integrating with our networks platform, if the kind of QE path that, you know, Julia mentioned earlier um, is not undertaken, um, it, it would be on the provider to assume those costs. Copy. Thank you. Um, Bradley, I see your hand is raised. I just wanted to clarify about the, the existing health homes. The care managers would be able to bill um, for for screenings only, or yes, and uh, services and um, the language is on navigation says that if they are currently providing and. and for health related social needs that they cannot duplicate, they cannot bill for the navigation. Uh, you just, you, you went out for a second there. I didn't hear part of what you said. 
Just screening alone is what I'm hearing. Keith, can you jump? Sorry. Um, I, I cannot, and I will admit that the health home one is one that I'm not as confident answering. That would probably be the one, Zach, where I would definitely defer to you on that one. <laughs> and if so, and if so, would it, would I think we he was saying, I think he was saying that if it was covered by another funding, not, we could not reimburse it again for that. That I get. So, Okay. But it sounded as if you um, the the health homes are restri are restricted to screening only. Um, it, I believe it's screening and potentially service provision. I believe those might be the two buckets. Zach, me keep me correct and feel free to utilize the chat. Um, I believe the question is, it sounds like navigation there might not be an opportunity, and thus maybe screening and perhaps service provision if it's not being covered by another federal state local funding source might also be an opportunity, but I will ask Zach to confirm that. And I also just wanna know we're documenting all the questions and so we'll send out um, written versions of the Q&A as well. And so if it's not clear here, we can get um, okay. you. And I do uh, see a comment yeah. that said that they're already paid for service provision. So if that's the case, it may be limited to screening. Right. Through our existing platforms. You could utilize you could utilize our, our networks platform if interested. Um I'm gonna take us back just to alternate between folks who are writing in the chat and raising their hands. So I'll take us back to some chat questions. Um uh, is there an option to use the prepare tool instead of um the uh AHC tool? <laughs> Um, social, oh, go ahead. I was to say for the social care network, um, the New York State requirement for reimbursement is that the accountable health communities tool is used, that AHC tool. Um, at this time, we don't have a plan set out for any other tools to be able to um, integrate with the network or be reimbursable. So for um, New York State guidance, we are going to be using the uh, AHC tool for screening. Julia, um, how will we know um, whether a patient has already been screened? Will this be visible in Unite Us? Um, yes, and this is also a process that we'll still need to kind of work out um, in, in collaboration with our QE partners. Um, definitely, if the screening has taken place in Unite Us, you would see it. Um, there is also an expectation that um, all of the networks are, you know, partnering with a qualified entity um, to support data sharing, um, not just to the shiny, but across kind of the SCN ecosystem. And so um, based on some of the, the requirements as defined in the operating manual, this would also be, you know, screenings that take place outside of the the network and or the network's referral platform. And so we're still thinking through like what the actual workflow will look like, but our assumption is that there would be the information, there would be the ability through our QA partners to also um, have access to um, screening information that or know when screenings have taken place outside the network as well. Great. Thank you, Keisha. And I, I'll just call out, um, it looks like Zach was able to answer a question in the chat. So um, somebody asked about uh, a copy of the operations manual and if it was finalized. Um, and Zach shared that um, the first version was not a public document, um, but we hope that the second version is able to be um, shared soon. Um, and I will go to Zabika. Um, you have your hand up. Zabika, are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, now we can hear you. Okay, sorry. I have two questions. Um, can you first question is can you help elaborate on health homes and SCN provider reimbursement since they both use separate billing tools? How does this systems ensure no duplication? And my second question is 
what are the guidelines from DOH towards the HRSN screening that are reimbursable, while many healthcare providers who also screen patients and submit claims for Z codes through SDOH screening tools like Prepare? Um, the, the first question, and I may have to defer to Doc on some of this, I, I'm not quite sure if there is an, an electronic um, kind of solution to ensuring that there isn't that duplication versus the onus being on the provider to ensure that. Um, I'll try to see if there's any language in, in the manual during this meeting, but I think there's an expectation that the provider um, is 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 ensuring that that it's not a duplicate versus there being any requirement that the distinct and discrete platforms that you utilize identifying any duplication. And then I'm I'm not quite sure. I, I might you repeat the second part of your question again. Sure. Um, so we, for example, many health health centers or clinics does prepare school tool screening, which entails, you know, similar as your screenings in terms, bills for Z codes. How does, does DOH has any guideline in terms of how does that entail with HRSN screening, which are somewhat similar screening tools? Just want to make sure that, you know, the guidelines are clear in terms of yeah. we're not when we are developing workflow? I mean, the, the only screenings that will be reimbursable under the waiver, um, and these are kind of, again, under the SCN, not necessarily other um, workflows and mechanisms that you have in place today. The only screening that will be reimbursed under the waiver are screenings that take place using the AHC tool or kind of a, a comparable equivalent, which essentially does have mapping that it, that is the exact same question. So in some ways, it's really the AHC tool. Those are the only screenings that will be reimbursable under the, the SCN. Thank you, Keisha. Um, I see Yuri has a hand up. Hi, uh, thank you. My questions were along the same lines of the prepare and whether Unite Us is gonna give us a report of who has been screened. Uh, so most of them have been asked, but I guess the one that I can add right now, um, for patients that are being served both by SOMOS and public health solutions, uh, and certainly many of our patients move uh, through the different boroughs, what are the strategies for data sharing or like how do we plan to approach that part of the puzzle? Yeah, we're, we're optimistic that our QE partners would be able to help us with some of that data sharing, given kind of the requirements to partner with QEs and, and kind of a process that the state has established. But there are also an expectation that from kind of a, an SCN perspective that we have established some workflows and have identified points of contact at other SENs to be able to close the loop and share information, especially in New York City, knowing that the state has drawn these perfect regional boundaries that don't really exist. So leveraging um, maybe some of the technology pathways versus creating some established processes and commu communication processes to facilitate bi-directional communication sharing um, with the other SENs in the city. Um, we are optimistic that 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 will assist, and we'll you know have to kind of um, refine workflows um, based on lessons learned as we start to roll these out. I also want to mention um, we haven't gotten to the part of the presentation that talks about the ways in which the capacity building team is going to be interacting with you all, um, and so you know of course we can continue to take some of these questions, but. I'm hoping that once you hear a little bit more about what we have to offer, you'll be reassured that you won't be alone in trying to um, integrate these practices um, and figure these questions out. Uh, we intend to assign practice improvement specialists to work with you um, if you decide to join the network. So just wanted to point that out. On that note, Natalie, let's take one more question from the chat and then Leah, let's um, move on to that section. 
Okay. Um, um, sorry. Uh, I have a, I see a question about a decision um, on the governance RFP. Do you want to share any information about that? The governing body? Um, I'll defer to Zach, but if, if he's still having technical difficulties, I'll try to answer that question. What's, what's the question about the governing body? Decisions it's and notification of decisions. Oh, very soon. <laughs> the the We're just proceeding with the selections have been made and they're proceeding to the board for ratification. And then and as soon as they are ratified, um, hopefully next week, we will be notifying folks. Thank you. Um, and just, you can keep putting questions in. Um, we're compiling a document and so we are tracking all of the questions and we will be in touch um, with any that we can't answer um, in today's call. Um, great, so I think uh, we're gonna move on to the next section. Um, Desiree, you can go to the next slide. Oh, that was the question slide, awesome. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to be speaking a little bit about kind of the quality standards, um, as Julia alluded to earlier, and then also, as Natalie was speaking to, kind of what we can offer um, as a capacity building team and kind of our role in helping um, to support you through this process. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we and do anticipate kind of with all of this work, there, there are going to be certain kind of um, things that we're tracking and monitoring as relating to quantitative numbers, like number of screenings, number of assessments, all of that from kind of a performance tracking standpoint. We're not getting into that um, in today's call. It's just kind of used for context of so there are going to be those kind of um, numbers that we're looking at, but we also really want to, we don't want to understate the importance of the quality of all of this work um, and how we want to go about it as um, the social care network lead entity. Um, and so we really want our screening navigation um, and services to be provided in a patient-centered, culturally and linguistically relevant, trauma-informed and kind of peer-delivered manner. Um, and we wanna make sure that those, um, the services that are provided in the SCN are representative of those quality standards. Um, and really the role of our team um, is to be there to support healthcare providers, you all, um, to meet these specific standards and be able to participate in the SEN um, in whatever manner that you wish to participate. Um, and so our team really uses a framework um, of helping you as a site assess where you are on a, a quality um, continuum for screening and services and come up with a plan to figure out how to kind of reach proficiency um, in these standards. So we are really here um, as a support and kind of to help you along that quality continuum. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and we can kind of back this up with our experience of doing this. So Natalie spoke a little bit about this at the beginning, um, but we have over 10 years of leading quality improvement, capacity building, and research and evaluation initiatives um, across over 100 healthcare partners um, um, in the New York area. Um, and our general approach of kind of what we provide um, to those partners that we work with, um, we promote the use of evidence-based practices, uh, we assist with goal setting, uh, we provide specialized trainings, quality improvement coaching, individualized technical assistance um, to really get at what an individual site may need, um, and then also sustainability planning with the goal that, you know, the work that we do um, with a site in a kind of structured manner is, be, is able to be continued beyond our time with them and really sustainable into the future. Um, next slide, please. And kind of the way we package our capacity building work, um, it tends to be in, in the model that we follow, which is a quality improvement learning collaborative model, um, which brings teams together around a common aim um, and has key features of obviously capacity building, um, a goal to kind of build internal expertise um, and QI methodology, again, meant to be sustained um, beyond our initial work with them with the idea that leading to long-term sustainable improvements. Um, we also, uh, this model also really promotes the use of shared learning. Um, so participants are able to engage in peer learning um, and exchange insights and strategies of things that they're um, facing around this common goal and aim. Um, and then finally, data-driven improvement. Um, so ensuring that teams are using data to identify um, areas of improvement and then also track their progress over time. 
Um, and so those are kind of the key features of the general quality improvement learning collaborative model that our team um, likes to follow. And then specifically, we tend to follow the Institute for Healthcare Improvements Breakthrough Series Collaborative, which is a specific type of quality improvement learning collaborative. Um, and this type, this model brings organizations together again around a common clinical or operational challenge. Um, and so in this case, it's going to be, you know, integrating um, the screening practices, navigation, um, service provision into your practices. Um, and then participating organizations are guided through cycles um, of group learning sessions. So again, coming together, sharing what's been going well, what challenges you're facing, and an opportunity to learn and share with each other. Um, and then individual action periods where sites are able to apply that knowledge, kind of what they're learning at the individual, at their individual site level and test out different things um, that uh, are you know, proven to be best practice as it relates to this content uh, and perform plan, do, study, act cycles to see kind of what's working, what's not, and then come back to the group learning session and repeat and repeat. Um, and all throughout the process, collecting data to ensure that we have a really good idea of what's working and what's not and where we might need to modify. Um, next slide, please. And so kind of what this means for you all in terms of what could what you could expect working with us um, over the next um, two plus years and working with the capacity building team um, if you are joining our network. Um, we, again, provide group learning sessions, um, individual and group TA, where um, both individual sites can come to troubleshoot a specific idea that they're, uh, a specific issue that they're encountering, or clusters um, who are facing a very similar issue. We could bring together similar practices to kind of uh, facilitate group technical assistance, um, training, there's going to be a whole uh, suite of different trainings that we're going to be able to offer to really support um, this process. And then the use of quality improvement and evaluation tools uh, to support this capacity building work. We have a suite of tools that we've um, used and that we've uh, found to be very effective um, in our capacity building work. So those will definitely be on offer. And then in general, um, just a meet you where you are approach. Um, our team takes that approach very seriously. Um, and we understand that folks are coming in with a variety of backgrounds um, in terms of where they are on the quality and uh, the uh, spectrum of being able to provide these services. Um, and they're coming in um, with different limitations and strengths. And we really want to ensure that we're meeting where you're at and providing um, very specific um, assistance to help you move along the continuum. Um, and then in terms of who you can expect to be interacting with, um, our team is hiring uh, pra practice improvement specialists, and they are really going to be kind of your main point of contact for everything related to capacity building, quality improvement, technical assistance, um, and they're going to be um, uh, a big support and kind of moving this work along. And so you'll see them in technical assistance calls and learning sessions, um, and they will really be your go to person. Um, from an administrative standpoint, um, you'll be interacting with program managers, and then uh, we will have a training manager who will be overseeing all things related to training. Uh, next slide, please. And then we know that this is a lot of information um, and we're going to be working um, you know, over the next two years. And so we just want to slate out what are kind of the immediate priorities of what we can be looking to um, in the next few months as it relates to training and TA. Um, and so we will um, want to make sure that everyone is, you know, versed in the Unite Us platform. Um, they also have um, a basic training on the AHC tool, um, acknowledging that there will be a need for more uh, specific advanced trainings. Um, it's not just going to be one training and done, um, but this will kind of be the, the um, basic AHC tool training. Um, and then also making sure that folks have a foundational knowledge in person-centered screening practices. That's a big, a big term and it encompasses a lot, but we really want to make sure that we're doing something immediately at the beginning to support um, ensuring that the practices, um, that the screenings are being done in a person-centered way. Um, I think that was all I had for my slides. So I think we'll have some more time to answer some additional questions. Um, we have about a half an hour and so we can try to make our way through other questions. I'm not sure if any additional questions came in during that section, Julia. Yeah, um, 
Desiree, if you could take down the slides, I think that's fine for the section to have them down. Um, I want to prioritize if folks have questions about anything that Leah presented on related to uh, capacity building to support. And then we can obviously, with the time we have left, um, try to answer questions that have not been answered from the first section. Um, so I'm just going to take a, I think I see Zach has been diligently answering questions in the chat. So if you haven't been following there, take a look and see if he's answered one of your recent questions. Um, I will um, take a question from the chat from earlier that relates to uh, the fee schedule that, that Zach also answered in the chat. If folks have questions about Leah's section, please raise your hand or put them in the chat. We'll come to those first. Um, but the question in the chat is, has the fee schedule for the screening and enhanced services been released yet? And we also had a question um, in the chat earlier about whether there is a specific breakdown or what of what are considered enhanced HRSN services. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there are these buckets of the enhanced care services under the social care network. Uh, that's food, housing, transportation, and there's some care management as well that are considered enhanced care services. Um, without going through a full list of them, it's quite long. It will be released uh, with the fee schedule when that is finalized. As Zach said, the fee schedule is still under development, um, but there are services within those um, four categories that are considered enhanced care services. Um, there were... Uh, I see Therese from Apicha um, has your hand up. Go ahead. Why don't you ask a question verbally? Will there be an effort to segment the population we serve? For example, will there be a technical assistance on what is culturally competent care for the transgender populations? Leah, can you take that one? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we will absolutely place um, much importance on ensuring that we're grouping sites together and um, that might serve similar populations or have similar concerns or want to cover similar content um, in training and technical assistance. Um, and so we're absolutely going to be keeping that in mind. It, Thank it you. might also be a good opportunity, Leah, Julia, to maybe highlight kind of our approach with our tier two partners, whom I know several of them are also on this call as a part of supporting yeah, that just came to mind for me as well. I'm happy to share a little bit. So um, as I mentioned there, well, actually, I haven't mentioned this on this call, but it has been mentioned on previous calls around the Roadmap Advocacy Coalition that there is certain eligibility requirements for these enhanced care services. Not every Medicaid managed care member is eligible for them. There are certain clinical criteria and social need criteria that enable a person to receive these enhanced care services through the SCN. Um, there are several uh, communities and populations that have been identified by New York State for these criteria, um, and they span a, a, a range of um, community of populations. I don't want to miss any, so I'm going to try to pull them up. Um, let's see. So um, it includes... Uh, this is verbiage from the New York State, uh, Medicaid high utilizers, individuals enrolled in a health home, uh, individuals with substance use disorder, individuals with serious mental illness, um, individuals with intellectual or developmental disability, pregnant and postpartum persons, individuals who are 90 days post-release from incarceration with a chronic condition, juvenile justice involved youth, foster care youth, and those under kinship care, high risk children under the age of six and children under the age of 18 with one or more chronic conditions. So those are all from New York State. Um, and we have partnered with uh, organizations uh, across New York City, many of you are on the call now, who have expertise in serving these communities and populations and have been doing so for decades. And we intend to um, use that partnership to ensure that the partners across our social care network are equipped to provide services to folks across those different populations, as well as ensure that existing service providers for those specific communities and populations are well equipped to integrate into the networks. There will definitely be um, training, capacity building opportunities around those communities um, and certainly communities beyond those that are named by New York State to ensure that there is uh, cultural and linguistic competence across the network. All right, let's take a couple more questions. Um, there's a question from the chat. Actually, let me just see if there's any. 
Okay, there's a question from the chat from earlier. Can you please clarify what your data security and consent expectations will be for healthcare providers? Um, I will quickly speak to the consent expectations and then perhaps Keisha or Zach can speak to data security. Um, I mentioned earlier that there will be a question zero as part of the screener that is required before um, members are able to be screened without that consent, whether it's verbal or written, uh, the screening cannot proceed. So that is a critical, critical part of the screening process and engaging members in the social care network. Um, that consent will need to be documented, whether it is a verbal um, consent that's documented by the screener or a uh, consent that is uh, physically documented by the member themselves. Um, and as was mentioned before, there are um, features in the Unite Us platform that allow for both. And I see a follow-up question just from Kristen in the chat while we're there. Will the question zero be built into Unite Us? Yes. Um, Zach or Keisha, I'm hoping you can take uh, speak a little bit to data security. What specifically about data security? What are the requirements? The question was just around clarifying what data security expectations will be for healthcare providers. We can leave it at that. If someone would like to come off mute and clarify, I'll leave space for a couple seconds for you to do that. And if not, you can fill in in the chat and we can come back to it. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey. Um, I think, um, you know, some of us that work in the health home world know that there are uh, security protections that we've had to attest to related to, to Medicaid data. Um, you know, that seem that they're going to be extending to the social care network. So I think the overall question is is somewhat specific around, is this screening going to be considered Medicaid data, you know, subject to that SSP process? And kind of how does that, how is that going to trickle down to network participants um, and our kind of data security requirements? So it, it's likely to be quite similar. We have reviewed draft language and we have provided feedback uh, on some of it, um, it is uh, screening data is considered protected health information. So obviously um, covered by HIPAA um, and the SCNs are working out um, the extent to which uh, network participants will have to act as business associates. Um, so I don't, we don't have all the answers to that question yet. Thanks, Zach. Um, Cindy, I see you have your hand up. You're welcome to come off mute and ask your question. Um, hi, yes. Um, so just to clarify, and I'm sorry if um, this question was already answered. So one screening per individual per year, no matter if it was done by a healthcare provider or a CBO. And then there will be a platform where both CBOs and healthcare providers can see if that individual had a screening already. Yes, that is correct. So the requirements from New York State are that um, a screening can be done uh, or is reimbursable once per year unless there is a life event that warrants rescreening. Um, all of this, I know there are so many questions. There will be more detail on all of these requirements once folks are a part of the network. Um, and the, yeah, so every, all of our network providers that choose to use Unite Us will be on Unite Us. Data from the CBOs and healthcare providers will be on the network uh, platform and will be able to uh, see that data of whether and when a person was last screened. All right. Great, great. Thanks, Cindy. Um, I want to take another question. What, there are two similar questions. One is in the chat. Can we touch on the application process for healthcare providers to join the network formally and how providers can access the application and when it is due? I saw there was also another question in the chat from earlier. Um, if you are both a community-based organization and a healthcare organization, would you have to apply to the RFP? 
Um, so I'm just, and there was another question, if a healthcare provider can provide CBO services, but did not apply as a CBO, is there the ability to add that to their contract? So I just want to, I can speak sort of on the whole to these questions here. So um, we are in the process of working with New York State to finalize uh, contracting details and to understand how that impacts our timeline for releasing a request for applications for healthcare providers and being able to onboard folks with contracts. Um, we hope to be able to do so as soon as possible, but unfortunately, I don't have a specific date to be able to share in this meeting here. Uh, we will certainly be in touch um, by email when uh, we have more information to share, if not then um, on future work group calls around timeline. Um, but we do hope to be able to release an RFA for healthcare providers um, as soon as we can. Um, if you are a... If you meet the requirements for both a community-based organization and a healthcare provider, there are slightly uh, there are a few additional requirements for community-based organizations to join the network in that capacity. Um, if you meet the requirements for both, um, you only need one contract to partner with PHS as a member of the SCN. So if you have applied already as a CBO through the process in August where the CBO RFA was released, you do not need to reapply as a healthcare provider. If you are applying as a healthcare provider and you offer services beyond healthcare that perhaps fall into those buckets of enhanced care services, whether that be um, food, housing, transportation, care management, or you're planning to offer navigation services, um, that is also something that you can do through the healthcare provider application. So you would only need to apply through the healthcare provider RFA um, and PHS during the contract process would work with you to identify the services that you intend to provide as a member of the network. All right. Um, Leah, I know you're, there's, are there any, I don't see any hands up. If there are any other folks who want to ask a question verbally, please do that. Let's see what else we have. Leah, please feel free. Hi, this is oh, okay. Ashley, go ahead. Yeah, I was just asking the question that I put into the, you know, first, thank you for answering all these questions. Um, I just wanted to understand if sort of how, what the patient or community member experience will be like in terms of their understanding of how their data is going to be used and shared and specifically will any CBO in the network have access to the screening information and results, or would they just be able to see that the screening was conducted just in terms of understanding how far that information mm -hmm. is flowing and knowing that there's certainly value in sharing that with the net network, but also being conscious of how sensitive that information is, especially with some of what you guys mentioned about potential to share screening information, same question with other SDNs. So you have to obtain consent from the member before you can even <laughs> view any type of uh, screening information. So uh, there's sort of three pro three steps of consent, and at each step of consent, you are ask requesting something different. So first, you're asking the member, "Do do I have?" your permission to screen you and share the results uh, with the health information exchange. The second question is on the navigation side, do I have your permission to access your screening results? And then the third consent is, do I have your, your permission to share <clears throat> your food uh, insecurity screening with our food and nutrition service providers. So there are three stages of consent that are outlined. In terms of what will be visible, there will be <clears throat> just unique role definitions for within community-based organizations for who can view information. Um, so not everyone will be able to see if someone is a Medicaid member on the roster, see if they've been screened. Um, they will, uh, 
that will be determined by, you know, who has been designated within an organization to conduct screening. Um, so there's a lot of um, protection in the policy of the state for in, in place for accessing this information um, through those kind of three levels of consent that I described. Thank you. John, go ahead with your question. I just wanted to confirm that health home CMAs can apply as a provider to be part of the provider network. Zach, it sounds like you're taking all questions health homes here. So do you mind jumping in? I think that's a yes. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a yes also. But okay. without having a final, you know, operations manual. Um, it's hard to be 100% definitive, but we think so. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. Um, there was a question in the chat um, around, can care, are care managers able to bill for, oh, sorry, are care managers able to bill for screenings only or also for navigation and service provision? And I will um, have a go at answering this question and then ask if anybody else on the team wants to weigh in. Um, we are not being overly prescriptive in terms of who is, which staff are eligible to provide services and whether that makes them reimbursable. We know across your organizations and across your settings, there are a wide range of staff types that are going to be offering different types of services. Um, we know that a lot of folks use peer models, and we've heard from a lot of our partners that they would like to um, engage peers in screening. Um, and as Leah said, peer-delivered services will certainly be a part of um, the support that we're able to provide around capacity building and quality standards. Um, so there isn't a, a specific restriction on uh, which staff are able to provide which services as long as it is you know, within their scope of work or if there's any licensure required to offer a specific service that that is in place. Uh, but I'll open it up if there's anyone on the PHS side that would like to add to that. That was good, Julia. I just I do want to say that these are great questions and we they're also helping us um, understand what your concerns are. And we will try to compile a Q&A and have that sort of on record. But I also want to reassure you that we will be meeting with you regularly and in an ongoing fashion. So there will be many other opportunities to get your your questions answered. Yeah, so we'll take a few more before we start to wrap up. Um, we have about 15 minutes left and I see. Uh, I'll take one from the chat and then Karen, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, you'd be welcome to. I see Ben Yemen has asked uh, a couple of times. So I'd be happy to answer if you would, uh, if we'd be able to elaborate on the reimbursement limitations for FQHPs. So um, Zach mentioned earlier that we still are waiting definitive guidance from New York State on this. Um, but what I said earlier and what I'm able to say now is that our understanding is that where a service is reimbursed through Medicaid fee for service, Medicaid managed care, or another third party payer, it will not be then again reimbursed through the social care network. So I'm not sure if that is much elaboration, um, but until we have a definitive answer to provide, um, that's the best that we can, can say in this meeting today. Um, Karen, I saw you come off mute. I will uh, give you a second if you'd like to ask a question. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to Eliza. Sorry, that was an accident. Okay, no worries. Then Eliza, go ahead. Hi, um, I have two questions. One, uh, one is the screening and another is navigation. So first of all, as healthcare providers, uh, some of our providers' workflow is patients are waiting right in their office and self-completed. Uh, uh, certain types of questionnaires. So we envision some practice may elect to do so, and then the providers can review the responses. So, and clarity on on the reimbursable component of this, I would say yes, but I don't want to assume. Um, I'll, I'll ask my second question and then you can respond. How is the navigation attribution logic is going to work? 
So let's say 100 people get screened. Who's going to do the navigation work? Have you guys thought through some of that as well? I can take your first question and then I'll turn it over. I saw Zach, he'll come off mute. Perhaps you can take the question around navigation. Um, the first question around uh, folks using self screeners or having clients fill out screeners on their own and then having a provider follow up. Um, the guidance that we currently have from New York State is that a a face to face one on one interaction. I shouldn't say face to face because um, Again, the virtual, whether it's a video call, a phone call are also reimbursable, but a one-on-one -on -one interaction between a provider and a Medicaid member um, is what is necessary to, a part of what is necessary to make a screening reimbursable. If a client fills out a the screener on their own, there must be a subsequent one-on-one -on -one interaction with a provider okay. regarding that screening for it to be reimbursable. That's the guidance we have from New York State at this time. Um, and so that's uh, the answer to your first question. And Zach, I'll turn it over to you if you are able to respond in terms of the navigation. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> we are trying to stick to our navigator of last resort um, approach. Uh, because we want to provide as many opportunities for um, CBOs who do navigation uh, to be able to participate in this waiver and to be reimbursed. Um, so we will have a small um, navigation team and that acts as a navigator of last resort for screenings that are not responded to by our contracted CBO navigation partners. I want to also emphasize that if healthcare partners are having difficulty thinking about um, how to do this process within the context of their clinical setting, there are many CBOs who are eager to do the screening and navigation, um, and they, they'd love to partner with practices. Um, the, that could look different ways. It could be that they pick up at the point of navigation because the you want the screening to happen. You want the screening to be in the EHR, um, uh, and or it could be that they do the whole process on site. Um, those healthcare organizations that do join the data and IT platform, they may want to use their own community health workers that they have, you know, all, there's so many different forms of practices. Some have social workers, some have community health workers, some have navigators. In those cases, those folks can join the platform, they can operate within the platform. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of different ways that this can look. But we we are dedicated. We are committed to um, bolstering the navigation workforces that currently exists in community to the leveraging those workforces to the greatest extent possible. And PHS itself will only serve as a navigator of last resort, kind of watching the um, system and picking up any uh, patients that are approaching the the deadline, if you will, for um, navigation to commence. Good. Thanks. Great. Um, I think we'll take if there's one last verbal question. Otherwise, I'll give a second for someone to raise their hand or come off mute if you have one, and we'll take a look through uh, the questions that have been asked in the chat and see if there are any others that we're able to answer today. All right. Um, I don't see any new hands up um, and looking through the range of questions, it looks like we have been able to get to a large number of them and those that we're able to provide an answer to in this meeting today. I know there are some that we didn't answer um, directly and I'm sure there are going to be more lingering questions that come up as we move through this work. So. Um, 
we are, I'd like to take this time to turn it over to Natalie to wrap us up um, and share what the next steps are going from here, because there will be many more opportunities to ask questions and engage together. So Natalie, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, um, can you show the agenda? I'm not, I'm actually, I think the next steps are that we will be meeting. Um, can you, is, are the next steps on the agenda? I can also take it. Okay, sorry, I didn't, I don't recall what they were aside yep. from that we have meetings on the schedule in the next, every month for the next three or four months. Yeah. Um, I think also stay tuned for information about an RFA, but go ahead, Julia. I'm just going to repeat exactly what you said, which is that um, we are going to be hosting these meetings um, monthly for the next several months in order to have a touch point where we are able to share information with you, where you are able to ask questions of us, and that we are uh, communicating and collaborating as we move through this process, which is still very much uh, in flux. Um, we will send out calendar holds for those invites. I want to, again, just say thank you to everybody who uh, made time for this meeting. I know it wasn't scheduled with all that much notice. And so we definitely want to get those future meeting dates out to you and your team so that you can put that time aside. Um, so that should be coming your way shortly. We will, as Natalie said, are in the process of developing an RFA for healthcare providers to join our network. We will, as soon as we're able, share information on that. And if you have questions about the RFA, there will be a process to submit them as well. Um, and we are hoping that that will happen in the very near future and we'll be sharing more information soon. Um, I will just open it up. Zach, Keisha, Leah, Natalie, anyone else on the team, if there's anything else you feel like we've missed, otherwise I'll wrap <laughs> up. I would like, like, to, I would like to, to uh, send us out with a little bit of hope and inspiration because I know this work is hard, um, but having seen what some of the benefits here that are available for folks, the the eligibility criteria are significant. So these things are not going to be available for everyone. There are population specific eligibility and then service specific eligibility. But for those who are eligible, the benefits are great. Um, rental assistance, two months back utility bills, um, significant community transitional supports, um, food delivery, meal delivery, um, really incredible respite services. Um, so these can have a tremendous impact on people's lives and people's health. Um, so always our first priority is how do we work with you all to ensure there is good access to these, the best possible access we can achieve to these new benefits. And so, you know, I know it's, we've been focused a lot on the restrictions and the requirements and the regulations, but anyone who's interested in helping us get members access to these benefits, we wanna work with you and we will, we will find ways to make it work. So um, yes, that's just what I wanted to to close with. All right. Thank you so much, Zach. And thank you to everybody again for taking the time to uh, join us for this meeting. We will definitely be in touch with you. You'll see us in your inboxes and we are looking forward to seeing you at the next work group meeting. Everybody. Thank you.